Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help a couple homeowners out with problems they're having with shifting bricks and settling concrete, both very serious things, but the solution may be simpler than you might think. Either way, those are problems you have to take care of right away because they're not going to stop sinking or stop pulling away, right? They're not going to get any better, that's for sure. And we're also going to talk to a homeowner who has a pretty interesting project and one that DIYers tackle all the time. She wants to paint some varnished pine cabinets. Can you do that? Yes. And there is a process and we give her a couple of tips so it comes out like a professional paint job. And what a great before and after picture that you have once you see cabinets that you're, you know, darker cabinets that you're so used to having. And all of a sudden, they're nice, bright white or off-white. Right. That's a yeah. really good project. You know, another thing that people um, kind of get puzzled at a lot of times, if you have a stump out in your yard, you know, it's really hard to dig a stump up without equipment, especially a sizable stump. Now, what about some of the treatments that they have where have you seen people drill holes in it and pour chemicals down? Down in there, does that really work, or what is the best solution? We we provide a homeowner a number of options to try to tackle that stump. And I've got a simple solution. Here we are in the middle of the summer. I got a simple solution: five tips for helping your lawn survive a drought. Well, I know you just got somebody's attention there because it's uh, I bet. <laughs> going into a time where it's really going to get uh, to be quite a challenge to keep that grass nice and green. Okay, let's get started. We've got so many emails and calls and uh, Facebook posts about decks and people in different stages of either building a deck and and quite often they're trying to refurbish their deck. Actually, Chelsea right now is stripping all of the finish. What a job! All of the finish oh, yeah. off of That's her. That's a tough job. At least it's a fairly small deck, but she she you know she always has a great positive attitude on things and and what she's doing she's just saying hey I'm I'm doing five boards a day. You know, just five boards, I'm stripping them down. And, you know, Joe, we've talked a lot about the, of course, we, we, we don't like to recommend some of the real caustic type of chemicals that are out there for stripping if there's another way for you to get the job done. And she's using the citrus um, stripper that right. we've yep. used on some furniture refinishing. And uh, she says it is really working extremely well and not, not as aggressive, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's pretty safe to use around plants and pets and kids and everything else because it it's called citrus strip or citrus something depending on the manufacturer because it contains some kind of citrus acid which i guess they get from oranges or lemons or limes or whatever and it's it's you know it's quite powerful in that formulation as far as cutting through um, a finish and helping you get down and you and follow the direction directions because you do have to be pretty patient with a lot of these that's the one downside of not using t- caustic chemicals is the chemicals work really quickly where this stuff takes a little longer but is much safer so just follow the directions don't rush it and it usually works pretty well but if you're you know looking out at your deck and you're not real proud of how it looks there's so many ways that you can improve it um certainly uh pressure washing carefully and yep. what what do you think about the circular type of attachments for <clears throat> for pressure washers i see a lot of people oh, using yeah. those you used to those these things were about two foot in diameter now i notice that a lot of them for decks have gotten down to you know 15 or 16 inches round and you just hook that um hose to it what or hook the uh, pressure washer up to it but what i like about it is you're getting consistent pressure on those boards versus taking a pressure washer and you know you might be 12 inches away the 16 inches away right. then five inches away you're going to damage that deck without even realizing it but um i love that little attachment i noticed they're got, gotten very reasonable yeah i'm not sure how effective they are but you're right that that's the best thing is that it holds the the water consistent the spray nozzles a consistent distance above the deck so you're not too far away or too close in fact i showed a simple solution probably last summer maybe the summer before it's been a while how to make a little uh, wheeled caddy that you screw to the end it's kind of it looked kind of goofy but it worked great it was just a couple of wheels and a little piece of bent piece of i think pvc we just clamped to the wand of our mm-hmm. of our gar- of the sprayer of the pressure washer and then you can just roll it back and forth you, you can almost do it with your eyes closed but mm-hmm. um yeah now pressure washer only 
remove so much of the finish and ordinarily it just cleans it. it doesn't really remove a finish and we hadn't been getting some calls and emails about people who who had either painted their deck which uh-huh. neither danny or i really recommend yeah, yeah. um or they put on solid color stain which again is a little too close to a paint and sometimes you have problems with it so how do you get paint off a deck well you could rent a big old sander but i found a tool danny that works really great and it attaches to an angle grinder and if you don't have an angle grinder you can rent one or probably could get one for 10 bucks a day uh, to rent one it's called a dima brush that's d-i-a-m-a brush i guess it's kind of like from diamond right because it has on the underside it has diamond grits on this on the abrasive part of this circular attachment you basically just bolt it onto your angle grinder and it cuts through about as quick as anything i've ever seen and whether it's a small deck or a large deck um it won't matter because it cuts so quickly and it grinds right down to the bare wood then at that point you know you can go to what danny and i would probably recommend which would be a semi-transparent stain Mm -hmm. or clear wood preserved if you don't want to leave it you know bare Right, right, exactly. You know, on, on this deck that we uh, built, uh, actually, I had I had heard of KDAT lumber or kill dried lumber, which basically, right. um, let's see, kill let's see KDAT stands for killed dr- killed dried after treatment. So after, after treatment, the pressure right. treatment, you know, you know how we talk a lot of times when you build a deck or or you, maybe you're wanting to um, um, build a fence out of treated wood and maybe uh, stain it, uh, you have to wait a while. You have to wait for the rain, I mean the uh, sun to kind of pull a lot of that moisture out of there so that the paint will absorb into the pores of the wood. Well, with kill dried, you don't have to do that. You can stain it immediately. So as soon as we put this down, first of all, the quality of wood was incredible. I mean, uh, the almost almost no knots. I mean, this was a amazing wow. uh, lumber that we got. And then we put everything down with screws and a really good coated screws and then uh, turn it over to the homeowners, as we often do on the painting, and let them paint while uh, or stain um, kind of overnight almost so that it's ready to go the next day. And, man, it turned out so nice, and we built stairs. And then we used the cable rail system. Oh, yeah. Um, at, yeah, every yeah. three inches, that, that stainless yep. steel. And took a little time to put that in, but, man, is yeah. that ever a great look. And, you know, it uh, doesn't block your view when you have a nice view in the backyard. Uh, I really love that whole system. I, I can't wait for uh, everybody to see that particular episode. Yeah, if you've not seen the cable rail system, they're pretty slick. You see wooden, typically wooden or PVC posts, vertical posts, but in between the posts and under the handrail, you just see really thin cable, maybe a quarter inch diameter. And the trick, Danny, is, as you now know, is when you're running it through the post and you get to wherever the end is, make sure it's just long enough that you can tighten up that little, like, turnbuckle thing, because you want those really taut. That's right. And the whole idea is you don't want them spreading apart so some little kid could get an arm, a leg, or, God forbid, a head Uh stuck in between. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a cool way of going. But if you're tackling that deck, we would encourage you to head by todayshomeowner.com and just put in our little search engine there, um, deck refinishing or uh, staining deck or any of those terms or like cowboy that. Cowboy Danny you, builds a deck. Cowboy Danny builds a deck. You can you can do that. <laughs> and uh, you'll be able to get all the information you need to make sure that you do it right and you don't have to do it uh, so often. Well, let's see if we can help Mike out. Maybe Mike needs a clamp there. I don't know. Mike, uh, <laughs> well, welcome to the Today's Home on a Radio Show. Hey, Danny. I appreciate y'all's show. I love it. Listen to y'all all the time. I also live in Mobile, man. I love Oh, Mobile. is that right? Oh, oh well, good. Well, yes, well, sir. Just might be right around the corner from us here. I, I see that uh, you sent us some pictures. I appreciate that. And uh, you, you have some bricks here. The pictures are fairly close up. So tell me exactly where this is in relation to the garage. Okay, this is my daughter's house. She lives in Mississippi. She lives close to the water. Mm-hmm. But if you was looking at her double garage doors, to the left of the the garage doors is about a foot of brick, and it's pulled away from the top, probably an inch and a half, and then it you know just goes all the way down to the bottom. I went around back, and the cricket, the brick is not cracked or anything. And I'm wondering to go to a brick mason or a, you know, somebody for a foundation. I just wanted y'all's advice. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of movement. I mean, if you're looking at a, a gap of an inch and an inch and a half. Now, at the bottom, is it still, is it gapped or is it tight at the bottom? It's, you know, it's it's not real tight. It's pulled away some. It's just leaning. You know what I mean? Sure. Now, and you don't see any cracks in the face of the brick. That's correct. Yeah. Right. And the, and behind the brick, then, 
Um, is that uh, a wall section there that's behind the actual brick that the bricks should be attached to? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. What and, is, what and let me tell you, inside the garage, mm-hmm. uh, the, the ceiling has pulled away from that wall, cracked a little bit. You know, you, you can tell that maybe the two by fours are, or the two by sixes has come mm-hmm. loose because of that wall, just a little bit, not bad. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one one thing um, for sure is there's no way to rack those bricks back in place. Uh, those bricks uh, yeah. ultimately are going to have to come down. If you put a little filler strip or try to fill it in some way, it, it's it'll look a little bit better, but it's still movement is taking place. I I think uh, Joe, I'll get your opinion on this, but I. I think I would take these bricks down carefully and see what's happening behind it, see if there are brick ties where they should be, see what the this um, movement in relation to what you're seeing inside the garage. But I think I would access it here um, because either way, those bricks have to come down and then they'll have to be put back up. What do you think on that one, Joe? Yeah, Mike, I was thinking the same thing as far as trying to repair this or push them back at the place. There's just no way to do that. <clears throat> Typically, when there are usually two or three reasons why a brick veneer will pull away from a building, it's either, uh, well, I guess four if you want to include the foundation has failed, but that doesn't sound like it's the case here. But either lumber shrinkage, a lot of shrinkage in lumber will pull back. Um, any water penetration could cause a problem, especially if it can't, if any water gets behind that veneer and it can't go get out through seep holes. But one of the main reasons is insufficient wall ties, which Danny mentioned. A lot of masons just don't put in enough wall ties. And for people who don't know, wall ties are simply little corrugated pieces of metal that attach to the wall behind the brick and get set in the mortar joint. And the whole idea is it just, as it as the name implies, ties it to the wall behind it. And they should be placed every three or four courses. And there's no reason to cheap out on them. They probably cost a penny a piece, so they should be more wall ties than you need. But that, so if you take this wall down, you might discover why it's being pulled away, and um, and then a skilled mason would have to come back, a brick mason, to put this in and put it in correctly. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too, because I have no idea that. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's no, there's no quick repair. We can't. Oh, just push it back and fill it in with caulk and go swimming. <laughs> It'll be fine, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and and yeah. I have, t- I have taken down lots and lots of brick walls, and uh, certainly, you know, eye protection, a cold chisel, a heavy, um, small mallet uh, to to um, hit on the a uh, cold chisel. And I'll tell you, also taking an abrasive blade on a circular saw and scoring the joints, get you a dust mask, and scoring those joints will make it even easier. Easier. I mean, the best case scenario is they come down well enough that you can actually clean and reuse the brick. But sometimes bricks will be a little brittle and you can't. But if it's a fairly new house, you'll be able to find those uh, those bricks somewhere. But hopefully we've been able to help you out on this. And uh, uh, next time you, you see me in uh, Mobile, uh, say hello and we'll talk some more. Hey, thank you all so much. I love you all show. Y'all are great guys, I tell you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. We have we have a lot of fun with it and everything, Mike, and uh, certainly uh, uh, admire you for helping your daughter out. I'll tell you, when you when your daughter um, has a house, you, you constantly want to be available to help them out any way possibly can. Time for our Best New Product segment brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. If you're a DIYer or you do a lot of woodworking, you all know that you can never have too many clamps. They're so handy for so many things that you do around your shop and your house. Yet there's times when a standard C-clamp or F-style clamp just won't work well because there isn't room for the handle. That's why Bessie designed the gear, gear clamp, the first of its kind. The gear clamp works big in small spaces to provide a unique clamping solution because the patented gear mechanism allows the can- the cl- uh, clamping handle to be outside the work area for greater clearance in those real cramped locations. The gearbox is fully enclosed to keep out dust and debris and a quick release shift button makes setup fast and easy. Plus, the ergonomic handle allows you to easily apply up to 450 pounds of nominal clamping force. So if you want some more information on on this Bessie 12-inch gear clamp, log on to homedepot.com. And that's certainly a true statement there, Joe. You can never have never too have. many clamps. I, I just bought four clamps that I'm uh, – long clamps that I was using uh, – plan on using for my shutters. Ended right. up we built a little rig that we didn't need it. And so I said, okay, well – 
should I take these things back? Well, since then, I bet I've used it for 20 different things, you know, on clamping this and clamping that. And and uh, so, yeah, you can't have too many clamps. And, and I always think about, you know, if you have someone that's, a, you know, you're the, a friend or father or uncle, whatever, that um, does a lot of woodworking or, or is handy around that, here's another great gift for someone just that's to right. buy them some clamps that will help make their work a little bit easier. Kathy's on the line with us. Uh, Kathy, welcome to the Today's Home Water Radio Show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Tell us tell us about this. you got a little painting project in mind. What's going on? Yes, sir. We have the tongue and groove, um, the tongue and groove on our cabinet, uh-huh. and they're varnished. And I was wanting to know the best way to prep them and paint them. Okay. All righty. Uh, I'll tell you what, it's funny. I was just looking at a house um, that my daughter's thinking of buying, and uh, it has a, um, it was a house that was built in the late 50s, and it had this exact same cabinet in there. And we and we were just talking about what she might do to freshen that up if she indeed gets the house. And boy, this was like, I mean, whoever lived in this house for all these years, this thing was flawless. You know, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of times those cabinets will get banged up and everything, but uh, they, they, they really took care of this house very very well but it is uh kind of you know older and you you know to brighten it up you definitely can benefit from that well there's a process and uh, i'll tell you part of it and let joe fi- finish the other part of it first of all you have to eliminate the gloss that you have on it so you can do that by lightly sanding it Um, but because of the grooves that you have in there you might want to try um, a liquid sandpaper or a deglosser that can also work um, in conjunction with the sandpaper I I don't I, I wouldn't use just the liquid sandpaper I'd still do a little bit of sanding and you're not trying to you know get it all the way back to the bare wood you're just trying to knock the gloss off and get it thoroughly clean um, after that it's time to put a really good quality primer on there you'll want to make sure that you use a, a really good one Joe I know you have one that you're going to recommend to or to use for that and and also buy a good quality brush to minimize the amount of brush strokes that you have on it and then after that it's time to really get a good quality acrylic latex and Joe wouldn't you recommend a semi-gloss or maybe an eggshell for the finish yeah you don't want anything kathy you don't want anything too you don't want like a high gloss although high gloss would provide the most amount of protection but it would reflect every single little defect in the in the wood so yeah once it's clean and sand you can also clean it with tsp trisodium phosphate just dilute it um and then um with a primer you want again you want to buy same thing with the paint you want to buy the best paint and primer you can you can afford and they do make paint specific and primer specifically for cabinets um and if you're going to brush it on there's a product called flow trawl which is f-l-o-e-t-r-o-l it just makes it (laughs) when you if you're brushing or spraying but in this case brushing it makes it even and by the way you're gonna have to take these doors off remove the hinges and the knobs you know because it'll just make it a lot easier i assume you you're we're gonna do that anyway and then um Prime it um, with the primer recommended by the top coat manufacturer, um, and then that, and then put two coats of the 100% acrylic latex paint. That's about the best you can do, and just lay them flat, let them dry. And obviously, you're gonna have to wait for one side to dry. I usually do the backs first, let them dry, then flip them over and do the fronts. Now this sound, right. this this might sound a little complicated, but I'll tell you, every uh, a number of articles and videos we have available at todayshomeowner.com on painting cabinets, painting kitchen cabinets. I, I'll bet there's a video on there of painting that exact type of cabinet that'll guide you through that process. Right, and we also have a bonus room that has the same stuff, you know, material in it, and we were wanting to paint it as well. So, you know, because like you said, this is an older home. It was built in 1957, and so it needs to be brightened up. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'll be glad you did. Some people say, oh, don't ever paint that, you know, stained wood like that, but... You know, it it's, it does make it feel a lot better and brighten it up a little bit, gives it a whole new look, and uh, I think you'll be very happy once you get it all taken care of. All right. Well, um, do you have a certain kind of primer that you recommend? There's a company called um, yeah, Kills, K-I-L-Z. Mm-hmm. Um, they make a, a line of primers, and unless you're going over really heavily stained, there's one called Restoration Primer that's super thick, and it 
will hide just about anything. But unless you have like really bad stains or lots of knots or something, you probably just use the one of the other um, primers. Maybe one they make three or four. Make be, use one that's like not the cheapest one, the next one up. Um, or as I recommended before, the top coat manufacturer will make that the paint that you're going to use in the final color will recommend a, a primer for specifically to be used with their paint. So you might want to check that as well. Okay. All right. So you can't just use a regular uh, latex paint, you know, like uh, trim type paint and the uh, semi-gloss. You can. Yes. I'm just saying they do make uh, they do make um, cabinet paint paint specifically for kitchen cabinets i know okay. benjamin moore makes one that i use i think it's called advance something like that mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if you go to home depot and just ask them for a cabinet grade paint they'll they'll point you to the right direction okay all right well good luck kathy thanks and y'all have a great day Okay, you as well. Take care. Hey, I wanted to mention a great email we got, Joe. A few weeks ago, we had a wonderful homeowner, Joanne, on the on the radio show. And right. uh, she was very frustrated because she had done a little bit of work on the front of her house and so forth and dripped a lot of paint on her front porch bricks. And oh, yeah. you know, it's hard to get that. paint out of bricks because it soaks into it and so forth. Well, we mentioned two different products, Goo Gone and Goof Off, and uh, similar products with different companies. And uh, she wrote us a note. I thought Danny and Joe would like to know that the Goo Gone that they recommended successfully removed the paint drips from my front porch. Oh, great. It took several applications and a little elbow grease and uh, working it with a stiff brush, but it worked very, very well. Thank you for your tip, and thank you for having me on your radio show. So that was very nice, Joanne, to yeah, thank uh, get you, back Joanne. with us on that. So yeah, Right now, we're going to go right back to the phones, go to New Mexico. Mike is on the line. Mike, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Absolutely. And now, I understand you're tackling something here, a 40-inch diameter tree stump. Do you, wow. Do you, do, you, do you have your arms wrapped around it, and you're, just, you're, you're wrestling it left and wrestling it right? How's, it, how's that working out? Yeah, well, I've been trying to pull it out, but uh, for some reason, just can't muscle the string. <laughs> well, that's a pretty that's a pretty good size. One Forty there. inches! Wow, Mike, <laughs> that's a big tree. <laughs> yes, it is, and uh, I was glad when it finally fell, and that went uh, went very well. But trying to get the stump out it has been a very big challenge, and I'd like to do it without having to go out and rent a stump grinder. Right. But I've heard so many different ways to do it, uh, and most of the time people talk about all the failures. So I said, well, you know, probably best just to talk to the experts. <laughs> there you go. Well, well, well I tell you, it, it is an ongoing problem, and I've often thought over the years, and, and I haven't done a lot of research on this. I'm anxious to hear what, what Joe um, has to say about it, because I see so many people with these ugly um, stumps in their, all over in their yard, and you know, a lot of times uh, it's maybe in the backyard where you can't even get a sizable stump grinder, or, and certainly not any kind of digging machine to get rid of it, and there's got to, somebody has to be coming up with something that can allow this to deteriorate really quick. Joe, what, what what do you think would be a way short of doing the um, stump grinding, which is still a viable way of going, sure. but uh, any, any suggestions on this one? Yeah, Mike, um, first, a 40-inch diameter stump is going to be a lot of work no matter what method you use. Um, and the only thing I would recommend, and I typically recommend for stump grinding, if you have um, only one stump to get rid of, it doesn't even hardly pay to um, to to rent a stump grinder. You might as well just have a guy come out, at least around here. I'm not sure in New Mexico where you live, but around here, I see signs people put up all the time that they're grinding stumps. And, it's, and for slightly more than the cost of renting a machine, you can just have a guy come out and do it himself. Now, if you want to try to remove this stump, um, you might be referring to uh, the different methods where they use some kind of chemical. There's potassium nitrate, um, which you can find. There's a company called Grow More, which is pretty ironic. It's called Grow More. And they sell a <laughs> they sell a stump remover. That's potassium nitrate. Um, Bonide. That's B O N I D E. Bonide. They make a great line of products, and they actually have decided that uh, potassium nitrate doesn't work quite as well. So they have one that's made out of. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can think of the name of it, but it's. But anyway, it's the. It's called Stump Out. It's actually, it's a sodium beta bisulfite. But in any case, the idea is you drill holes into the stump or, or you 
cross hatch cut it with a chainsaw you pour this stuff on it takes a while add a little water and it eventually just rots out the stump so th those would be your probably your basic options either use some kind of chemical or just hire a guy to come out and grind it away for you i see okay because i do know many years ago i had a smaller stump right and there was a chemical that was ammonium nitrate based and it basically turned the stump into a a fuse in which you could burn it, but oh, uh, yeah. the government has uh, removed the ammonium nitrate-based uh, methods. That's right. I think burning the stump is probably not allowed in most places these days. Yeah, that's a that, and that does still take a long, long time. Now, I had a large one, at the, almost this large, ground down in my yard, and what I did is I was right there with him to rake back all of the shavings so that he could get it really down below, uh, about six inches below ground, and then I was adding some dirt to that area anyway. Worked great with me. I haven't seen any more of it. I got grass growing on it right now, so that is one other option. Hey, so glad you're with us here on today's homeowner. We want to share with you a few tips about metal roofing brought to you by our friends at the Metal Roofing Alliance. You know, one of the best things about a metal roof is how low maintenance they are. You know, thanks to special coatings and paint, cleaning the metal roof is uh, not only easy, it's more environmentally friendly, eliminating the need for any harsh chemicals. In fact, plain water can often wash away all of the dirt, dust, and other debris on a metal roof. Now, while it's a good idea to check with specific metal metal roofing manufacturers on what the recommended cleaning method is. A simple way to clean most metal roofs is simply to mix a quarter cup of mild detergent per gallon of water. That's it. You just apply the solution to the roof surface using either a washcloth sponge, a soft bristle brush, or a non-abrasive pad. The goal is to use the lightest touch that will effectively do the job. Let it stand for 5 to 10 minutes, rinse the surface with plain water, and that's really all of the maintenance that you need to do. You know, you think about like washing a car. If you don't wash your car and you, you end up coming back and washing it once a year, well... It's a tough, tough job, but doing it every month or every few weeks, it makes it a lot easier, same way with a metal roof. So cleaning a metal roof couldn't be easier or more trouble-free. Just remember to clean and fix any gutter issues you may have. Keep the trees and any tall shrubs trimmed back away from the roof, and then you may want to have a professional inspect your roof every few years to make sure that they can catch any small issue early. And remember to always use proper safety techniques if you're not comfortable about getting on that roof hire a professional to take care of it because a wet metal roof can be a little slippery and uh, but there's a lot of great tips and a lot of information about the benefits of metal roofs at the metal roofing alliance website and that website is metalroofing.com that's metalroofing.com for a lot of different answers to the questions you may have about metal roofing so you know it's just uh, every time i turn around joe i'm seeing metal roofs going on on neighborhoods yep. out in the country just everywhere it seems to just growing and growing in popularity. Yeah, it, it's it, you'd think it'd be more popular on the, in the coastal regions, but I see it up here in New England, especially up in Vermont, New Hampshire, where they get a lot of snow, and you want to get that snow off a roof quickly. Well, there you go with a metal roof; it comes sliding off. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of there's almost no region in this country where you're not installing metal roofs. So here's how the process works. You know, I'm driving down the road. I'm just kind of thinking about solutions to certain problems that we have around our home. And suddenly, a simple solution pops into my head. I put it down on paper, and I send it to Joe Truini, and he shares it with you each and every week. Is that how it works, Joe? That's how it works. In fact, this week, why don't you do the simple solution since, <laughs> oh, it, wait a since it came right out of your head? I'm going to sit back and give you all the credit. <laughs> well, sometimes I try to claim uh, – claim, I, I have <laughs> so – I have developed a few simple solutions along the way, but you definitely have. You definitely. But the lion's share of them comes from the brilliant mind of Mr. Joe Truini. Share another one with us, shall you, Joe? Thank you. Brilliant or not, this one actually did come out of my mind because out of my head because I had a problem. I bought a brand new range hood, which I love, but it has these small round lights, these bulbs, LED bulbs. And they're not only flush with the underside, they're recessed a little bit. And I thought, well, how am I ever going to, and one burned out, of course, so how am I going to, I couldn't get it out for the life of me. I tried every, I had someone else try it with smaller hands. I tried, I couldn't get the darn thing out. So here is the, first of all, and plus it's not threaded in. It's the kind that you have to push up 
and rotate it and it drops down on the side instead of having a threaded socket it just has on the side of the bulb it has two little lugs sticking out and it fit into slot so you push it up I, and you rotate I just put, it right? i just put two of these in my in my outside range hood right and my fingers are just not built for that it's crazy and that, that no i don't really know if anybody's tough. are yeah. Oh, no. well, and, and pl- so this thing is the bulb's not only flush, but it's recessed a little bit, and you have to push it up. But there's no room. It's not like it goes up a half inch. It, uh, maybe it goes up. I don't even know a sixteenth. So I couldn't get the darn thing out. I tried. Then I, I don't know what made me think of this. I went and I got a piece of duct tape. So if you ever have a light bulb stuck, try this. I took it eight. It's about eight inch long piece of duct tape. I pinched it in the middle, and it created this like T shaped piece of tape with the adhesive exposed on the top of the horizontal side you know it's sort of like an upside down mm-hmm. t in any case so i took it and i stuck it on the on the clean the bulb well and stuck it on the bulb so now there's this little tab of duct tape hanging down that serves as a handle then i pushed it up and i rotated and that that duct tape gave me just enough grip that How about I, that? and again you only have to rotate it maybe a quarter of an inch i don't think maybe even less than that and the bulb came out huh I felt so good. I'm going to write this down and tell Danny that about it good. so that he can good. say it's his idea. That's well, what don't I was tell thinking. my wife Sharon about that because when one of those burn out out there, I'm going to I'm get her to try, and they'll say, All right. dear, dear, I came up with this idea. It just popped <laughs> into my head. So <laughs> Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This one comes in from Linda in Arizona. When I run my garbage disposal, both sinks back up. What could be the problem? Well, Joe, I'll tell you, um, you know, garbage disposals, uh, I think uh, I think we all need a garbage disposal clinic, a little tutorial on how to use okay. a garbage disposal, because actually I would like my wife to attend that particular tutorial, <laughs> because you have to feed the, the debris into a garbage disposal slowly using plenty of water, not pile it up and heap it up there, and then expect it to work in the thorough nature that you want it to work. And a, a lot of times, if a garbage disposal is not used properly, it can have un, um, you know chewed up uh, material in there that can cause a backup and i think with linda here um, it almost has to be blockage somewhere down the line of that garbage disposal absolutely whenever you see water backing up into the sink sometimes only she has a double sink here sometimes it backs up into just one of the sinks she has a backing up into both I'm, i'm sure it must be a clog now it's not a full clog it's just partially clogged so if you fill the sink with water it'll probably drain out a little more slowly than it should um so yeah so she's gonna have to plunge it that's where i'd start anyway because that'd be the simplest repair what you want to do is plug up one sink drain you'll probably plug up this this drain that has the disposal on it and plunge the other one and then reverse you know make sure it's full of water by the way if it's not holding water pour some water into the sink then plunge it while there's water in there because that water will help with the pressure um and the reason you want to plug up the other sink drain is if you don't you'll just be sucking air in and out of that and, and you won't get much use out of your plunger anyway so you do one then you switch you do the other one um and run some water with some baking soda down there vinegar anything like that to help flush it out if that doesn't work then you need to Go to the next step, Danny, which would be to remove the trap from under the sink. Right. You can remove the trap then, and you have access to deeper into the drain that you can run a small six-foot plumber snake, or you might be able to use one of the drain brushes that uh, really work very, very well. But either way, I think that first step that Joe's recommended will be all you need, Linda. And thanks so much for that email, and we would love for you to send us an email here at the Today's Homeowner podcast by going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast and thank you so much for these great reviews i sat down and i read about 60 reviews a few days ago and really really nice comments we appreciate it we appreciate you guys enjoying listening to our podcast and we're going to keep doing it and keep working hard to make it the best we can possibly do so we want to hear from you again today's homeowner.com slash podcast i'm danny lifford along with my buddy joe truini thanks so much for taking some time and listening to our today's homeowner podcast 